Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Delaware, Delaware's uh, Small Movement Workshop. This workshop is presented by the Delaware Cooperative Extension Service, which is a joint effort between the University of Delaware and Dell State University. I'm Dan Severson, the Newcastle County Ag Agent, and our co-host are Susan Gary, the 4-H and Livestock Extension Agent in Kent County, Delaware, and Dr. Kwame Matthews, the Small Ruminant Specialist at Dell State University. So successful lambing and kidding is critical to the profitability of sheep and goat, goat operations. Lambing and kidding is also one of the most stressful time periods during a small ruminant production. Today, we're gonna to have Dr. Kevin Pelzer, who is going to discuss lambing and kidding issues and obstetrics. Dr. Pelzer received his BS from the University of Kentucky and his DVM in 1980 from Tuskegee University. He completed a residency in food, animal, herd health and reproduction and a master's in preventative veterinary medicine from, the, from UC Davis. He's boarded in the American College of Veterinary Preventative Medicine. Dr. Pelzer has been a clinician in the Productive Management Medicine Unit at the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine since 1987. He currently teaches a variety of classes within the DVM curriculum and performs clinical work with the, with the four-year DVM students. His interests are in small ruminants and public health. So with that, Dr. Pelzer, welcome. Thanks, Dan. As Dan said, I'm in the Production Management Medicine Group, which is our uh, food animal group here at uh, the Veterinary School at Virginia Tech. Um, thanks for inviting me, and uh, hopefully, folks, uh, you'll find this uh, presentation um, with a good bit of information. So uh, looking at uh, newborn health, um, <clears throat> we'll talk about uh, health of the dam. Um, the environment in which the kids and lambs uh, should be born and housed. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, adequate uh, intake of colostrum uh, and nutrition of the lamb uh, or the uh, kid. When we look at the health of the dam, uh, that's pretty important in our uh, lambing or uh, kidding uh, process. Uh, <clears throat> One of the things that uh, important is to check uh, girls for previous mastitis or evaluate their udder health. We must certainly palpate that udder, hopefully before breeding uh, to eliminate individuals that aren't gonna be productive uh, at the time of lambing or kidding. Uh, and generally when you palpate or feel those uh, mammary glands, uh, <clears throat> indication of mastitis or far, firm, hard nodules. Uh, also, one of the big uh, issues that I find in goats are bad teats. Uh, these are teats that are blown out or uh, so enlarged um, that uh, the kid uh, can't latch onto uh, at the time of birth and that restricts their ability to acquire colostrum and that sets them off at a very poor start uh, to their life without having that colostrum. We also need to periodically body condition score uh, these uh, ladies. Uh, ideally, we'd like them to uh, kid or lamb in a body condition score three. Uh, certainly don't want them too thin uh, as that will um, reduce the amount of colostrum that they produce. Uh, <clears throat> and we also don't want them too fat uh, in that uh, it increases the prevalence of pregnancy toxemia that may occur around the time of parturition or birthing. And uh, also they're over conditioned that fat can accumulate in the vaginal uh, canal uh, or vault and that can be uh, an impedance to the delivery of uh, <clears throat> the newborn. In regards to the proper nutrition in order to prevent that uh, pregnancy toxemia uh, issue that we see, uh, especially in dams that have two or more uh, fetuses, the last uh, four weeks of the gestation period, we should be feeding these guys between a pound and a pound and a half of grain uh, per head per day. Uh, also in some areas, I <clears throat> found that we'll see uh, milk fever or calcium deficiency uh, in uh, small ruminants. Um, <clears throat> they uh, exhibit milk fever differently than cattle in that 
With cattle, we usually see calcium deficiency problems after the cow has calved and during the first month of lactation. The majority of um, <clears throat> calcium issues that we see in small ruminants, uh, we see uh, within the last three weeks of gestation. So it's before they actually lamb or kid. And so one of the things that uh, we can <clears throat> do to help avoid that is if you add one third limestone uh, and two thirds uh, trace or mineral salt uh, together, that will provide them enough uh, calcium uh, to prevent that um, calcium deficiency. Also, in order to make sure that the lambs and the kids are uh, vigorous at birth, uh, we certainly don't want to uh, have issues with white muscle disease or selenium deficiency. So it's recommended that our salts uh, have uh, a minimum of 26 parts per million, uh, but preferably uh, 90 parts per million uh, to make sure that we avoid that uh, white muscle disease uh, issue in these guys. Excuse me, when we look at uh, housing environment, um, <clears throat> I find that especially with smaller producers, um, they don't ha really have adequate uh, space uh, or <clears throat> they uh, pamper um, their sheep and goats and don't require them really to get any exercise in order to eat uh, or to drink. So if we can spread these guys out a little bit uh, on the pastures, uh, make them move around a little bit more, uh, that certainly helps their uh, general physiology. Uh, it also decreases the chances of uh, developing uh, pregnancy toxemia, and it keeps them in better shape because the birthing event is fairly uh, intense in regards to muscle contraction output. So keeping these guys in shape will hopefully keep them in shape for uh, the birthing process. Ideally. Um, if you can, uh, you'd like to move your dams to a clean pasture or pen near the time of parturition. We don't see this as bad in small ruminants compared to that of cattle, but uh, the major source of diarrhea uh, pathogens or disease agents it comes from uh, the mother. And so if uh, we can move these guys to a clean area right before they uh, kid or lamb. Uh, we reduce the amount of disease agents uh, on that pasture uh, and gets us off to a uh, good start. Um, <clears throat> also, um, at least here in Virginia, um, our winters haven't been too bad uh, lately. Um, <clears throat> And ideally, if we can provide these guys a clean, dry, draft-free area or a clean pasture with a shelter uh, so that they can get out of the wind, uh, that's pretty much all they need in regards to a place to lay down and um, to give birth. Also, depending on your management system, <clears throat> many people will place their lambs and uh, kids uh, with their dams in a jug uh, essentially, it's a four or five by five foot square pen uh, in order for the dams and uh, the babies to bond uh, and to make sure that we don't have any nursing problems and that type of thing. Uh, one of the things that I find is that when people do this, uh, they may not clean those jugs out frequently enough. And if you wind up having a buildup of manure and urine, in there, then uh, air quality becomes a very big issue. And so uh, depending on what type of setup you have, uh, you need to make sure that there's adequate ventilation uh, in that area. I think this is the, the major reason why producers have uh, pneumonia problems in their lambs and kids is that they're in a, a damp, dark, uh, moist barn uh, with inadequate uh, ventilation. Also, um, to help with getting these guys off to a good start, we need to be prepared and be proactive. Uh, so we should have our uh, clean environment ready for these guys, put together a uh, delivery kit, and we'll talk a little bit later about um, what would be in that kit. 
umbilical supplies every once in a while i hear about people will call and say that uh you uh, gave birth to a lamb but the lamb is bleeding it is umbilicus we can easily take care of that with uh with umbilical tape uh which essentially is like shoestring type material and just tie a ligature around the umbilical cord uh, the other thing that works um, pretty easily and you can pick them up at the dollar store uh, are hair barrettes and just clamp a hair barrette on that uh, umbilicus and that will stop uh, the bleeding as well other umbilical supplies would be uh, either iodine or chlorhexidine solution to apply to the umbilicus to decrease um, infection going from the environment up into the umbilicus and causing uh, joint problems. Uh, and then also uh, we want to make sure that we have um, colostrum either banked from last year or we have colostrum replacement on hand as well as um, a urinary catheter in order to tube feed uh, these guys colostrum and then subsequently milk uh, if they need it. Umbilical supplies, as I said, we can use a hair barrette, um, have iodine or nalvasan. Uh, many people like uh, the 7% iodine or the tincture of iodine. It's becoming harder uh, to get because um, my understanding is that uh, they use that product in the generation of methamphetamines. Uh, and so it might not be available. Uh, the 2% iodine I feel is adequate. And in fact, uh, the 7% iodine, sometimes I see uh, when that's applied vigorously, it gets all over them and you wind up having scalding of the prepuce uh, and possibly even the vulva on these little uh, lambs and kids. Uh, Nalvasan uh, is the blue uh, disinfectant um, chlorhexidine. Um, it's a little bit milder on the tissues, uh, but one of the good things about Nalvasan is it does have some residual action uh, in that <clears throat> once it's applied, uh, it maintains its bactericidal uh, and viricidal effects for um, like a day or so. It's good to have needles and syringes on hand for a variety of things. Uh, if you're going to uh, give <clears throat> injections, uh, needle size, 18 gauge and 20 gauge are pretty much uh, all you're going to need. Uh, the 18 gauges are for the ewes and the does and the 20 gauges for the lambs and the kids. And then get some um, <clears throat> TV or insulin syringes. Uh, the most common shot or injection that you'll give at birth um, as part of a preventive program will be uh, BOC, which is a vitamin E and selenium preparation. Uh, if you read that, the um, instructions for that, it's labeled for calves and it's one, um, three cc's per 100 pounds. So that works out to be one cc per 33 pounds. Can overdose uh, selenium in these guys. <clears throat> when I ask people how much selenium or BOCI they give, they say, oh, we give a half a CC uh, or a CC. Uh, and I don't know about other areas of the country, but the lambs and kids that I deal with only weigh uh, five pounds on average for kids and seven, eight pounds for lambs. So uh, they only need um, a third of a CC. And so using the TB or the insulin syringe uh, allows you to get proper dosage in there uh, because you can actually see the gradations on that syringe so that you can give the proper amount. OB lube, um, <clears throat> we'll talk about the different kinds, but uh, that's good to have on hand in case we need to uh, provide some type of uh, intervention during the lambing or the kidding process. Uh, and some obstetrical gloves or uh, rectal sleeves to protect not only uh, us, but also uh, it increases the amount of cleanliness that we can provide uh, to the uh, you or the um, dough. Uh, soap and towels, um, <clears throat> also 
uh, for cleaning as well as drying the babies off. Uh, we talked about the feeding tube, um, colostrum supplies, uh, nipples, and one thing that always seems to be in short supply is the thermometer. Um, and so uh, one of those uh, is helpful to have in the, this kit as well so that we can determine if we have hypothermia going on or if we have um, some type of infectious process that's uh, causing a fever. <clears throat> All these things can be neatly stuffed into a toolbox uh, and it's preferable to put a lock on that toolbox, especially if you have kids, uh, because I find that uh, if I don't lock my toolbox, uh, when I go in there, I only find half my tools. So <clears throat> maybe your children are a little bit um, better at borrowing things than mine have been, uh, but uh, I'd certainly encourage you to keep uh, that box uh, in a safe, uh, clean place so that you can uh, <clears throat> use it uh, when needed. In regards to the lube, um, you can buy this J lube, it's a powder, and um, you mix it with water, uh, becomes very gelatinous. <clears throat> that can be used as a lubricant. Um, <clears throat> methyl cellulose, um, it's the OB uh, lube. You can buy it in a jug for like $13 from a lot of the vet supply uh, companies. Uh, KY jelly, you can use that. Uh, it tends to be uh, a little bit uh, expensive, but uh, that will work uh, as well uh, for a lubricant. And then a bag of these uh, OB sleeves. Um, I'd encourage you if you, you know, only have 25 or 40 uh, sheep or goats, uh, buy a bag of these and split them up with somebody because there's a hundred in a bag and uh, it'd take a while for you to, to use all those. Uh, they're relatively uh, inexpensive. They're about uh, 10 cents a piece. Soap and towels, uh, the soap, we have uh, ivory soap on our vet trucks and that's what we use to clean up the back end of sheep and goats as well as cows. It's cheap, it works very well. And uh, for those of you who were born uh, in the 1950s, you remember that the ivory soap, uh, their commercial usually had a little baby uh, butt in the commercial and they were using that ivory soap on that tender uh, tissue. So I figured if it was good enough for baby butts, it's probably good enough for the back end of a goat or a sheep. Uh, having a bucket is good uh, because you'll <clears throat> put water in that. And then the towels, a good supply of towels is helpful. Um, <clears throat> one is that the towel is not really used on the U or the dough. Uh, the towel is for you to be able to dry your arm off after you've cleaned the U or the dough up uh, so that you can slide the sleeve on. Trying to put an obstetrical or rectal sleeve uh, on a wet hand or a wet arm is uh, very frustrating uh, at times. And then once you get the babies delivered, you can use that towel then uh, to dry those guys off and uh, get them going. We talked about the feeding tube and I'll have a picture of those a little bit later on. Uh, we'll talk about colostrum supply as well. Nipples, just so that you can, um, are ready to bottle feed. Uh, anything that uh, may need it. And then again, make sure you got a thermometer. That's kind of uh, what we need to do, um, you know, just a couple of weeks prior to uh, uh, the lambing or the kidding season to kind of get us prepared for uh, what we uh, might encounter during the next uh, month. What we'll uh, do now is we'll talk about uh, the stages of parturition and um, and then we'll uh, get to talking about uh, when to intervene, some of the common causes of dystocias, and uh, ways that we can uh, correct those problems. So impending parturition, um, there's a couple of things that we uh, look for in regards to, you know, them getting close to giving birth. Um, the thing that's most noticed is uh, that these guys will start to bag up, form an udder, 
And <clears throat> uh, also there's uh, laxity uh, of the vulva. Uh, the vulva will certainly seem enlarged uh, prior to parturition. The other thing that you can do is if you feel uh, at the base of their tail, uh, there's generally a uh, ligament called the sacrosciatic ligament. Uh, that's a very firm structure that goes from uh, the base of the tail towards uh, the pin bones. That um, ligament uh, will relax um, just prior uh, to parturition. So you can feel that. And if you can no longer feel that um, ligament, then parturition is um, usually within two or three days. Um, so uh, look for that softening of that uh, ligament there. Uh, also, <clears throat> uh, we can look for uh, mucus discharge. Uh, one of the differences, um, <clears throat> usually when we see a mucus discharge, it's a matter of hours uh, before we see the babies. <clears throat> and that's true in cattle as well as sheep. Uh, but the goat, being a goat, she's going to be different. And I have seen uh, mucus hanging out of these guys for up to a week uh, before they actually uh, undergo kidding. So just because you see the mucus there in the case of a goat, if she's acting normal, uh, nothing to be alarmed about. So you might be able to see that uh, for a while before uh, she actually gets down to business to having uh, the kids. And here's a goat. Um, obviously, she's got a really big udder, uh, and you can see the mucus uh, plug. Uh, essentially, this is the plug within the cervix that's starting to break down in preparation to lubricate the vagina and then uh, allow easy exit for those fetuses. So when is it time, or why does the mom go into labor when she does? Well, the baby actually decides. The reason um, the baby decides is that uh, the baby gets stressed out and due to that stress, um, the brain uh, releases a hormone that stimulates the production of um, corticosteroid. And so the thing that we feel um, causes stress uh, in these fetuses uh, is that uh, they run out of space. As the fetus gets bigger, uh, space limitations occur in that uterus and uh, the baby then um, gets stressed, uh, the hormones released and then cortisol or cortisone is uh, secreted and then that changes the pregnancy uh, hormones uh, so that uh, the uterus starts to uh, contract uh, and everything starts to uh, loosen up. And so that's one of the reasons why um, twin gestation lengths are shorter uh, than singles uh, because they experience this crowding uh, earlier than uh, a single. So <clears throat> what this cortisol does is it uh, removes the progesterone block that for the last five months has allowed uh, the uterine muscles to just relax and be quiet because we don't want the uterus spitting those uh, babies out earlier. Uh, the progesterone essentially is converted to estrogen and then the estrogen uh, increases the reproductive tract secretions and it also primes the uterus um, <clears throat> to respond to oxytocin that's going to be released during parturition to cause uh, good contractions of uh, the uterine muscles. So <clears throat> this first stage, uh, there's three stages of parturition. Uh, the first stage, the goal uh, of first stage is to open and dilate the cervix. And during uh, the first stage of parturition, uh, the fetus plays an active role in positioning itself within the sheep or the goat. And for the most part, um, <clears throat> the fetus rotates and gets its head and its front legs up uh, into the uh, body of the uterus up against the cervix. Muscle contractions start um, and <clears throat> then the fetus gets pushed to the cervix 
and due to the pressure of the fetus as well as the uterine fluids uh, against that cervix uh, start to cause that cervix to dilate and get uh, thinner. With that pressure on the cervix, uh, that causes the release of another hormone called, called oxytocin. Uh, in people, they call it pitocin or POP. And <clears throat> when that's released, that oxytocin uh, binds to the cells, the muscle cells of the uterus and causes an increase in the number uh, and the strengths of uh, <clears throat> the uterine contractions. So the first stage of labor, we really don't see much um, from the U or the dough. This occurs <clears throat> or takes about two to 12 hours. For most, I would say two to six, but those that haven't uh, given birth um, before, uh, it may take 12 hours for them to kind of dilate that cervix and relax all the tissues associated with that birth canal. We may see um, these guys separate themselves from the rest of the uh, flock or the herd. Uh, they may paw at the ground. They'll uh, lay down, they'll get up, they'll feel uncomfortable. And then uh, another thing, <clears throat> you'll start to see that uh, mucus plug or more of the mucus plug in the case of goats. And <clears throat> oftentimes these guys will um, be laying there and they'll be chewing their cud and all of a sudden they stop chewing their cud and they have this far off look, like they're just mesmerized or totally out of it. And then after about a minute, minute and a half, they start chewing their cud again. And what they're doing essentially is they're working their way through a contraction. And so for the most part, um, part of this getting up and getting down also helps the fetus uh, get in the proper position uh, <clears throat> at the time uh, at expulsion. So this is just a group of ewes here at our sheep barn on campus that are waiting to lamb. And um, the thing that's amazing to me about um, sheep anyway, as well as goats, you know, we're when I was uh, taught that, you know, when animals um, are close to giving birth, they go off feed. Uh, I've seen sheep and goats uh, eating and chewing their cudden and then go back in the same barn and an hour later, there's lambs or kids laying on the ground. So these guys will eat up until the time that they actually uh, deliver. Uh, so I wouldn't um, take much stock in the fact that, yeah, she's not, you know, eaten so she must be getting ready to, to lamb her kids. She just might not be hungry when you look at her. So the second stage of parturition, um, what happens during this stage is the fetus is expelled. <clears throat> There's two uh, sacs of fluid. Um, we may or may not see uh, either sac burst, but those sacs also help um, dilate uh, the cervix and uh, the internal structures of the female reproductive tract. And then um, the fetus will enter the birth canal. And once it enters the birth canal, uh, its oxygen levels start to decrease because he's being kind of crunched. Uh, and this causes increased movement of uh, the lamb or the kid uh, itself. And the movement of those uh, legs on the cervix actually stimulate the U to start having um, contractions um, or straining that we can actually visualize. And so um, once the U starts straining, uh, we should see, or the dough, we should see a baby delivered within two hours. Um, usually it's within an hour. And so the general rule of thumb is that once you see um, the water break or fetal membranes uh, at the lips of the vulva or any fetal parts uh, that you should or dough should have that baby within the next hour uh, to two hours. Because these uh, guys uh, have uh, twins, there's always the question of how quickly uh, should the twin follow? And the general rule is, is that uh, they should have that twin within the next 30 to 45 minutes. Oftentimes it can be as fast as 15 minutes, 
uh, after they have the first one, but at a maximum, um, <clears throat> they should have the second one uh, 30 to 45 minutes uh, after the first. And a triplet, uh, again, uh, pretty much it's going to be born within 30 minutes after uh, the second one was born. <clears throat> so here we can see the one of the fetal sacs, and here's the tip of the foot. Uh, there's two fetal sacs. One is the uh, chorioallantoic or the allantoic sac, and then the other is the amnionic sac. Uh, this is the amnionic sac, and the reason I know this is because the feet are contained, or the fetus, and therefore the feet are going to be contained within uh, the amnion. So this is the amnionic uh, sac. Also, the amnionic sac, the fluid tends to be a little bit lighter in color, uh, as the allantoic sac uh, actually collects urinary products from uh, the fetus, and so it tends to be a little bit darker uh, in color. Here's a, a U where uh, the membranes have actually ruptured. You can see them, uh, they've released the fluid, and you can see uh, those little uh, toes there. Uh, of the lamb. So normally lambs or kids um, are born uh, with their front legs uh, extended and their head uh, resting on top of those uh, front legs uh, and then they're uh, pushed out. This is uh, what they call um, an <clears throat> anterior uh, longitudinal um, presentation, the back or the dorsum of the lamb is up against um, the uh, sacrum, the sacral bone right here. Uh, and so this is called a dorsosacral uh, pos um, position. And then uh, the posture is with the legs extended and the head on top of the legs. It's not unusual or abnormal uh, for uh, lambs and kids to be born backwards. In that case, uh, the back legs are presented first, uh, and then the butt shows up, and then the ribs, and then uh, the head and uh, the front legs. So as you can see here, here's the feet, and here's this little guy's nose. Essentially what uh, this U is trying to navigate is being able to push that big head uh, out of the vulva and stretch that vulva in order to expel uh, the lamb. As I said, uh, once they have one, um, the second one should be born within uh, 30 minutes. Thing um, I wanted to point out is that you can see this you uh, here, uh, she's had one and now she's expelling the second one. You'll notice that the second one <clears throat> is a lot oranger than the first one. Um, this is common, um, <clears throat> and the reason they're orange is because uh, they've re released meconium, the baby has, uh, or that first fecal material inside the uterus, and because a lot of that fecal material contains a lot of bile acids, that stains or colors these guys um, <clears throat> yellow, and so one of the things that uh, we look for in regards to fetal stress is that these guys will uh, release that meconium when they're stressed. Usually the second one uh, is more stressed than the first one because the second one's wondering how long it's gonna take the first one to get out. Uh, so it can get out. That's why you may see uh, some animals that are born completely um, with clear fluid, and then others have this kind of orangish, yellowish uh, stain to them. And you can see how yellow he is compared to, to him here. <clears throat> and then this goat, <clears throat> you can see this kid here, uh, no stress in this one. Um, nice uh, clear fetal fluids on him, and then a little bit of the membrane still draped over uh, the top of his head, uh, which you'll uh, quickly uh, clean up. So after um, the lambs or the kids are born, uh, the mothers do do have good mothering ability. Um, they usually turn around and lick them up uh, pretty good to get them going. If you have one that delivers and doesn't 
take right to the babies, then you need to be particularly careful with that one because uh, she may <clears throat> decide that um, she's had enough of this motherhood thing already uh, and keep an eye on her. So that one would definitely be one that you'd wanna put in the jug uh, to make sure that they uh, bonded together. At birth, um, if we're there, uh, it's good to remove the excess, excess mucus from their mouth and nose. I usually just stick my finger up there and kind of clean it out. Uh, rub their chest vigorously with a towel, dry them off. Before I do any of this, uh, what I usually will do um, is I'll grab a stick, a piece of straw uh, or hay and stick that up their nose. When you do that, they generally shake their head and they want to sneeze. <clears throat> and when they try to sneeze, that causes them to inhale and that gets them to take their first breath. So stick a piece of straw or hay up their nose, rub them with a towel really well. If they seem to have mucus uh, in their mouth, just slide your finger up there, pull it out, and then wipe off the end of their nose with the towel as well. And then <clears throat> dip the navel. Uh, and then you want to evaluate uh, the lambs and the kids for vigor uh, and look for any possible defects. And these guys should be up uh, and nursing within the next 30 to 45 minutes. So once the, uh, the baby's been born, that's the end of uh, the second stage parturition. And the third stage parturition is expulsion of uh, the fetal membranes or the placenta. And usually uh, they'll expel the membranes within 30 minutes or so after they're born. It can take, uh, usually uh, most of them uh, will expel them within the first two hours, but it can take up to as long as 12 uh, and be considered uh, normal. If the membranes are retained after 12 hours, then um, we classify that as um, retained placenta. Couple of things about uh, the placenta. As you can see over here, this uh, dough is um, starting to eat the placenta. Uh, the placenta is full of uh, protein. <clears throat> and as a result, uh, if this dough eats this placenta, this placenta essentially is gonna sit like a big piece of rotten meat in her rumen uh, and uh, be digested. It's not usual for uh, small ruminants to eat steak uh, on Saturday nights so when they go out on the town. And so they're not used to eating uh, this kind of protein. And as a result, they'll wind up getting indigestion. And this can throw them off feed for a day or two. So I recommend once the placenta has been expelled that it be removed from uh, the animal. Uh, it makes things a little bit cleaner. Uh, they don't need to eat it for any kind of nutritional value, and uh, it can only cause problems. So uh, get rid of those and dispose of them properly. Uh, also, um, <clears throat> don't worry uh, too much if the placenta doesn't come out after 12 hours. As long as the mother is taking care of the babies and she's producing milk and she's eating, uh, and everybody's happy, uh, you just kind of let the placenta sit there and eventually uh, it will fall out. If um, the placenta stays in and the ewe or the doe you know, goes off feed, they're not taking care of their babies, first thing you want to do is take their temperature. If the temperature is above 103, then more than likely they have uh, a uterine infection associated with that retained placenta, and you're gonna need to start them on uh, penicillin. But as long as everybody's happy and doing fine, uh, you don't have to worry about that placenta uh, hanging out behind them. Once um, uh, the lambs or the kids are born, and if you're gonna put them in jugs, um, <clears throat> usually um, they're just, put in the jug with their mom. Um, I recommend that uh, the first day that in the jug that the ewes and the lamb does uh, only receive hay. Oftentimes given grain, uh, they'll gorge on the grain and then 
They won't eat the hay and they'll get a little bit of a rumen acidosis or grain overload from that. And that will put them off feed for a couple of days. So just give them a good quality hay uh, the first day. It allows their GI tract to kind of get back to normal after um, parturition. Uh, also, they'll pay a little bit more attention to uh, their lambs and their kids. In regards to how long um, you leave these guys in the pen uh, or the jug, the general rule uh, of thumb is that they're in one day plus the number of babies they have. So if uh, you has a single, then she's in the jug for two days. She has twins three days. She has triplets four days. And then uh, they're moved to usually a communal area where <clears throat> the lambs uh, or the kids kind of run around uh, chasing their mom. So um, <clears throat> now we'll talk about uh, when things go awry. And one of the more uh, common things that uh, we encounter uh, right before parturition is prolapsed vagina. Sheep, for some reason, look for any opportunity that they can find to prolapse their vagina. Uh, goats, on the other hand, um, this picture here is like the fourth goat that I've ever seen with a prolapsed vagina in 40 years of practice. Goats tend to keep their private parts inside. Sheep, on the other hand, prolapse almost like if you look at them crosswise. Um, and so we'll talk about uh, why uh, prolapses occur and what we can do to try to, to manage those. So um, the reason uh, they prolapse essentially is that there's an increase in abdominal pressure. Uh, and that abdominal pressure often is associated with multiple fetuses. So uh, it's rare for a U to prolapse with just a single. Uh, generally, she's got uh, twins or uh, triplets in there. And essentially, there's just no more room in there as those fetuses get bigger and bigger and something's got to give. And I've never seen a sheep push out their lungs through their mouth. Uh, so I don't think that exit point is very viable. And so the only other exit point is to push out their vagina, uh, which they do. The other um, thing that occupies a lot of space within the abdominal cavity is the rumen. The rumen um, will band, um, especially if uh, the ewes on poor quality feeds. And what happens there is the ewes hungry, uh, and so she eats more, which increases uh, the amount of space that the rumen takes up. With the poor quality feed, that feed stuff remains in that rumen longer than usual. So a lot of times when we find um, a rectal prolapse outbreak, if we look at the hay that's being fed, uh, it's usually a poor quality. In my area uh, where we have a lot of mountains, um, remember we said that due to hormones that those ligaments back in the pelvis start to relax and things get a little bit loosey-goosey. If you've got a big U that's got triplets and she's laying down and her rumen's full, and if you watch uh, ruminants when they lay down on a hill, do they face uphill, downhill, or horizontal to the hill? They usually face uphill because it's easier for them to burp. Well, if their head's uphill, where's their rear end? It's downhill. So uh, now you got uh, gravity working against you uh, as those guys are laying on the hills. Crowding uh, at the feed bunk, um, you know, they get up there and they got two winter coats on and, you know, you got a feed bunk that's supposed to be good for 20 and now you got 20 pregnant ones and with all that uh, extra uh, fleece uh, as well as uh, just expansion of the abdomen uh, due to the fetuses, things get a little tight in there and out comes the vagina. Also in regards to vaginal prolapses, we found that um, if they're too skinny, uh, they're likely to prolapse. And if they're too fat, they're more likely to, to prolapse. So body condition score, again, uh, we should uh, be monitoring these guys throughout 
uh, gestation and try to keep their body condition score um, that of a three. I mentioned the weakening of the pelvic structures around the time of parturition. Uh, also, um, if the female has experienced vaginal trauma uh, from a previous delivery, uh, those tissues don't uh, heal back uh, quite normally. So uh, she may have lost some of that uh, internal integrity. Also, if she prolapsed uh, last year, uh, she's going to prolapse this year. So any uh, animal that prolapses needs to go to market as soon as uh, she delivers and has her babies. Also, um, <clears throat> this is heritable. And so um, if you have a ewe that's prolapsed her vagina, uh, probably shouldn't uh, keep her uh, ewe lambs uh, either, and they should go to market as well. Um, also, if uh, there's been damage to the vagina due to uh, a dystocia, um, that fits uh, along with the vaginal trauma and uh, increase in the likelihood of uh, vaginal prolapse. To treat these guys, um, you want to clean up the prolapse tissue. Uh, and essentially, I just use the ivory soap and lather them up and uh, wash them off. Uh, oftentimes the bladder will get stuck in that prolapsed vagina. Usually the urethra or the tube that runs from the bladder out into the vagina gets kinked. So before you try to put the prolapse back in, you want to lift that um, vagina up and that will straighten out the urethra. And usually you get a good spray of urine when you do that. Uh, and uh, that puts everybody at ease. Um, it also makes more space available uh, to push that vagina back in. So essentially, uh, you're got, just going to start at the sides of the vagina, and then you just kind of gently uh, push it in. Uh, try not to use your fingertips. Use the balls of your fingers, um, <clears throat> because sometimes the vagina is friable, uh, or tender enough that you can stick your finger through the vaginal wall. If there's um, damage to um, <clears throat> the wall, uh, you can put like a triple antibiotic ointment on it before you stuff it back in. If there's severe damage, uh, you might want to consider uh, putting her on penicillin for three or four days uh, or giving her a injection of uh, long-acting tetracycline like LA-200. Analgesics, I think one of the things that um, causes this uh, vaginal prolapse is uh, they push it out, uh, it gets stuck out there, then it gets irritated, so now it itches, so they strain more, so they push more vagina out, now it can't get back in anymore. Uh, and so there's kind of this cycle of pain, push, pain, push. Um, so. Um, talk to your veterinarian about getting some type of uh, analgesic. Um, banamine uh, has been used uh, for years. Uh, the problem with banamine is it ideally should be given uh, in the vein. Uh, some people have give, give it in the muscle, but it does cause some muscle tissue uh, damage. Uh, there are, there's a drug called meloxicam. Uh, it's used in people for arthritis, uh, and it's a very good pain reliever uh, for uh, pain in um, ruminants as well. So <clears throat> you can get your uh, veterinarian to prescribe you some meloxicam to keep on hand. If they have any questions about it, uh, tell them you heard that it's three, tab three 15 milligram tablets per 100 pounds of body weight uh, once a day and the meat withdrawal period for that is 21 days. So giving them some kind of analgesic uh, <clears throat> will help break that pain uh, or, uh, strain uh, cycle. Uh, keeping it in, uh, once you get it in, it's gonna pop right back out. So uh, we gotta figure out how we're gonna keep it in there. Um, <clears throat> there's commercial harnesses. I'll show you a picture of those that you can be used. Uh, there's this thing called a U-saver or vaginal retainer 
And then uh, you can also put a uh, purse string suture around the lips of the vulva uh, as well to keep it in. So this is um, a harness. Um, NASCO sells these. Uh, once you get it in, you apply the harness. And essentially what the harness does is it keeps them from being able to arch their back and get a good strain. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, that keeps uh, the vagina in. I came across um, this technique uh, a long time ago. Um, and for me, it works pretty well. This rope you see here is actually uh, used uh, for demonstration so that you can see the rope uh, rather than being uh, what you would actually use. What you can use is uh, baling twine. And so <clears throat> get two pieces of baling twine, tie them together and make one long string. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the baling twine, um, divide it in half, and uh, put one half of the rope on this side and one half of the rope on this side uh, back over their neck. Then you're gonna take the rope or the string and you're gonna pass it underneath uh, the brisket area and you're gonna come out on the opposite uh, side of the elbow <clears throat> of the sheep. And so put the loop over the top, cross underneath the chest and then the rope comes under and exits here. And then you're gonna bring this up and across her back. This rope that was on this side uh, crossed over and it's gonna come down and it's gonna again go between the leg and the udder. And then it's gonna come back and it's gonna cross over again. And when you get ready to set this thing. Uh, this X uh, where you got your strings crossing should fit right over the lips of the vulva. Because the lips of the vulva tend to be um, edematous or they've got some edema or fluid in them, they tend to be fairly tender. Uh, so what I do is I take a towel or a wad of paper towels and kind of make a little diaper and put that over here and then those strings don't cut into that vaginal tissue. And then um, you just bring the rope back up and then you tie it right here to the, root, the rope that came across. And uh, in sheep that have wool, uh, after about 12 to 24 hours, you're gonna have to tighten this thing back up because uh, the string will work down into the wool. Uh, it'll be loose. So you want this to be tight the whole time. And what this does, again, this cross over here in the back doesn't allow this U to uh, hunch up and to get a good strain. The advantage of using uh, this also, um, it doesn't block the vaginal opening uh, and they can actually lamb through this if they don't have that diaper thing uh, back there. So you can easily remove the diaper once the swelling goes down in those tissues. And if she decides to lamb, uh, she can lamb actually through that uh, stitch or that crossover. The other, uh, this is called the U-saver um, or the vaginal retainer. Um, I have never had good luck with these. Uh, I think the secret is to, uh, you put this paddle uh, in the floor of the vagina and then you angle this so that this piece of string is actually tied to a tag of wool on the side of the hip of the sheep. And you want this angled so that this paddle uh, angles downward uh, on the floor of the vagina. Uh, and uh, one good thing about this tool, if you can get it to stay in and the vagina to stay in is they can lamb uh, with this uh, inside the vaginal vault because the lamb just slides right across uh, the top of that uh, spoon or paddle. The third option is to get a uh, S-curve needle. Uh, you stick it here um, <clears throat> underneath the, the vulva. Uh, you go through the skin and then you're gonna migrate this needle out here close to the wool area and then 
pop out between the anus and the top of the vagina. And then um, you're gonna go back in here and you're gonna do the same thing over on this side. And then you've drug a piece of umbilical tape down here in the eye of the needle up and around. And then you tighten that down so that you can get uh, just a finger in there so that you can still urinate. And then you just tie that like you're tying your shoes and then um, that to keep the vagina in as well. I don't like this method uh, for two reasons. One, if she decides to lamb, she can't lamb through that suture. So you have to be around to open that up in order for her to deliver. The other is putting this umbilical tape uh, under these tissues. Uh, we get away with it in cattle. I don't think these guys have as much tissue proportion wise as cattle do. And so it's kind of irritating and sometimes uh, just putting that suture in will cause them uh, to continue to strain. So I only use this as a last resort uh, and uh, prefer the harness or uh, my rope uh, bondage technique. Other things that um, happen um, that you may have questions about is uh, what if she goes beyond her due date? Uh, you saw the ram uh, breeder. Uh, you've counted 145 days and she hadn't had uh, the baby. A couple of things could have happened. Uh, she may not have actually been pregnant due to that breeding. Uh, she may have resorbed uh, the pregnancy or possibly aborted prior to parturition and you just didn't see uh, the abortion. You could possibly have a fetal monster uh, brewing in there. The reason the fetal monsters occurs because they usually have a brain defect and so uh, they can't initiate that stress response in the hormone change because uh, those hormones uh, originate from uh, the brain. So the fetus just continues to grow and never gives that response that it's time to get out. Tell if, you know, uh, she's still pregnant. Veterinarians can uh, ultrasound and look for the baby, um, just like in human pregnancies, uh, or you can use that ballotment technique that uh, we talked about earlier uh, about, you know, how do you know if she's done or if there's another one stuck in there. Uh, the other thing, if you do the blotman technique, maybe that will stress him enough that the fetus will then decide it's time to come out. He's had enough of being jostled around in there by you and she'll have it the next day. So that was my last, she's gone beyond her due date at the sheep barn. We went out, we didn't have the ultrasound with her. Uh, we blotted her and I said, oh yeah, she's still got a baby in there. And a day and a half later, she spit the, the little guy out. The other, um, thing that um, can go wrong is stage one uh, goes longer than our uh, six hours. Um, or, you know, you really haven't seen much, but she's straining. <clears throat> In that case, um, you know, if she's been straining for half an hour and nothing showing, you haven't seen any fetal membranes or anything, it's probably uh, good to do a vaginal exam. Uh, in a lot of these cases, it may be that she just hasn't dilated enough, uh, but there is a condition uh, that occurs in sheep and sometimes in goats called ring womb, uh, where you go in and you can put one finger through the cervix, but um, nothing else. And she just keeps straining. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with those uh, they're not going to uh, dilate. If you want any real positive outcome, uh, the best thing to do is to go ahead and do a C-section uh, as quick as possible if you want to try to save those uh, lambs as well as the U. You try to uh, dilate that cervix. Uh, a lot of times you wind up tearing the cervix um, and uh, then what happens is the U develops uh, peritonitis or an infection within her abdomen and usually dies within the next uh, day or two. And now we talked about uh, prolapsed vagina uh, and straining. Um, <clears throat> you can see over here, we got both the membranes out and this guy 
and the prolapsed vagina. So uh, this really is kind of a nightmare. You can break these bags um, <clears throat> and then stuff this back in and see how dilated she is. Most of the time, she's not going to be dilated, and that's the reason why she's prolapsed. Uh, and again, either sacrifice <clears throat> the U <clears throat> and extract the babies or do a C-section. So I mentioned the ring womb, um, no signs of first labor. You see the fetal membranes with or without straining. You get one or two fingers in the cervix. So you say, well, she's probably just not dilated enough. You go back in two hours and you can still only get one uh, or two fingers in the cervix. And that's pretty much an indication of this uh, ring womb uh, problem. Ring womb, we don't really uh, know why. Uh, it occurs. Um, the things that we do know is that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you want any positive kind of outcome is to do a C-section on the U in order to get the lambs out and try to save the U. You can try to dilate the cervix, but usually we wind up tearing those and it takes you just as long to try to dilate a cervix as it does to uh, do a C-section. One possible, you know, if you don't want to invest the money in the C-section, you can load these guys up on uh, penicillin. Uh, they'll uh, usually dilate within the next three or four days, and then they'll uh, expel uh, dead, rotten lambs. Uh, and so the reason you put them on the penicillin is to prevent uh, uterine infection in that dough. Uh, it is genetic. So um, these guys should be called and any of their ancestors should be uh, called as well. Stage two, um, remember we said that once you see uh, fetal membranes or fetal parts that uh, you should have uh, a lamb or a kid on the ground within uh, two hours. The other is that if she's straining uh, and you see something like this and nothing's showing, then or if we see parts out, but there's no progress, um, then we're gonna have to uh, do uh, a vaginal exam uh, and go in and see what uh, our problem might be. You need to get your bucket out, put some water in there, get your soap and get your towel uh, that you're gonna use on yourself. Clean her up uh, and once you get her all uh, clean, don't dry her off because uh, we want it to be as slippery as what we can be back there, uh, but dry off your uh, hand and then put on your OB sleeve. The OB sleeves are good because you have dirt and hair on your arms uh, and that prevents you depositing that uh, material in the uterus uh, or the vagina of that female. Uh, likewise, there are several bacterial diseases that can be shed uh, during the birthing process. Uh, that is infectious to people. Many uh, physicians, uh, you're pregnant, they will um, tell you not to go in the lambing or the kidding barn uh, during your pregnancy uh, because these uh, diseases that um, sheep and goats that cause abortion in them uh, can likewise cause abortion in uh, humans. So good idea to keep on <clears throat> the gloves uh, protects you uh, as well as it protects uh, the does and the you. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, the lube. <clears throat> when you go in, you want to make sure that you apply liberal amounts of lubricant to your uh, sleeve. Um, <clears throat> you can never use uh, too much lube to make things slippery uh, inside there. So you'll put your lube on your sleeve and then uh, you'll go in and try to figure out uh, what's going on. When we look at um, the reasons things get stuck, about 50% of the time uh, it's fetal malposition. And that's either due to the fact that uh, a leg is retained or the head is turned back uh, or there's twins trying to get out at the same time. Uh, they get tangled up in there. So malposition is 50% um, of the time. Birth canal obstruction uh, occurs, uh, as I said, when two of them try to get out at the same time. 
or if the head gets stuck, something along those lines. Maternal fetal mismatch, essentially this is where <clears throat> the baby is too big for the pelvis uh, of the female and there's just uh, not enough room to get out. See that a lot in cattle, but uh, really uh, is not usually a problem in our sheep and our goats. Um, the only time that <clears throat> I'll see a fetal maternal mismatch with some regularity uh, are pygmy goats uh, where uh, the head is too big to pass through uh, the pelvis of the female. But for the vast majority of sheep and goats, this isn't a problem. Uh, and then uh, every once in a while, we'll have a fetal monster where uh, there's something developmentally wrong uh, with the fetus and he's just not pliable uh, to be expelled. So <clears throat> we mentioned earlier that uh, the normal presentation is this anterior uh, presentation uh, with a, the backbone of the lamb up against the sacrum uh, of the ewe or the doe and the limbs extended forward with the head on top of uh, the limbs. <clears throat> so one of the first things that um, presents an obstruction or difficulty for uh, the ewe or the doe is getting that head through uh, the pelvis and outside uh, the lips of the vulva. So one of the things that we can do uh, to help with this is uh, with this lamb's head being like this, if we turn the head slightly to the left or to the right, we can then take the uh, lips of the vulva and pull them up over the pole or the forehead of the lamb. And um, oftentimes just stretching the lips of the vulva with your hands, you just go in, uh, put your hands on the side of the lamb's head and then just uh, push against the wall uh, of those uh, vaginal lips and try to stretch them out uh, as much as you can uh, and then uh, pop the head through there. <clears throat> the other thing is that um, one of the things that happens is we got the lamb's head here, uh, we got the feet here, and ideally we would like this nose to be kind of in the middle uh, of that front leg. We have it in this situation like you see this guy it's kind of all bunched in there and it would be better if we can make him uh, narrower and so by grabbing onto one leg and pulling it that narrows the width of this area here and then we can pull this one out and then go back and pull this one and then go back and pull this one and essentially we're kind of seesawing uh, the baby out uh, of the vagina. And again, turn that head slightly uh, and usually they'll kind of uh, pop out of there. Uh, one other thing that happens is oftentimes these little legs will get back here and the elbows will get stuck right here on uh, the edge of the pelvis. And by pulling one leg at one time, we can pop this little elbow up and over that process there. Um, and then once we get that one leg popped, the other one will pop and then he'll glide out. So if you come up to a situation where you've got the head here, you got two legs, pull on one leg first, and then the other one try to extend those legs out and then grab a hold of the head, uh, turn it, and then pull with the legs as well as the head just cup your fingers over the top of the head, kind of like uh, the way you would grab a baseball or a softball, and then gently uh, put traction uh, on the head and the legs at the same time to move him out. The second obstruction is the shoulders. And again, uh, we're trying to make the shoulders more narrow to pop through the pelvic opening. And again, we'll stretch one leg, and that will <clears throat> pull the short shoulder forward. And then we'll go ahead and then we'll pull on this leg and stretch that side of the shoulder forward. Also, <clears throat> one of the things to consider is the shape of 
the female's uh, pelvis. And if we look at the birth canal here, <clears throat> you'll notice that the widest part is not side to side, but it's actually from the top here down to the bottom here. And so uh, you might think about this uh, kind of like a TV set. Uh, when you buy a TV set and they tell you that the TV is uh, a 60 inch screen, it's not 60 inches from here to here, it's 60 inches from the corner to the other corner. And so <clears throat> knowing that, what we can do is we can turn that fetus so that we get this shoulder at, up at the upper part of the pelvis and we get this shoulder at the lower portion of the pelvis. So by turning that fetus, <clears throat> kind of corkscrewing him out, by turning him uh, about a quarter of a turn, we then wind up maximizing or lining up the widest part of the fetus with the widest part of the pelvis. And so as you pull these guys out, uh, this is just how they would normally come, but by turning this, we get this wide part here, up here, and down here. By doing that, we kind of corkscrew them out and that lines this shoulder area up uh, with the widest part of uh, the pelvis. Uh, we'll do the same thing when we get the chest out. And as these hips start to enter, we'll again corkscrew or turn that uh, lamb uh, slightly to one side uh, in order to engage the widest part of this guy's hips with the widest part of that pelvis. So um, these guys tend to be a little bit slippery. Uh, so this is when you turn, pull out your uh, sterile lamb pullers, uh, which essentially is just a piece of clean baling twine, uh, put a slip knot on there and put uh, this around uh, his foot. Now, placement of the string, you wanna make sure that you get the knot tied around up above his fetlock. If you put the string here at the pastern joint, when you put a lot of pressure on there, there's a potential to dislocate this pastern joint, uh, which is not good. So uh, apply the string up here where you have more uh, fixed uh, and solid structures than down here around the base of his foot. So slide that up over the first joint um, and then cinch that down and then using the rope, you'll be able to pull uh, a little bit better when you uh, start to pull out on the lamb. Uh, oftentimes we'll go and uh, we'll see this situation where uh, we've got uh, the head engaged, uh, one leg is out, but one leg is back. So um, our goal here obviously is to get uh, this leg up and into position so that we can uh, pull the lamb out. In order to do that, most of the time, we're gonna have to push the lamb's head back into the abdomen. So uh, you can either grab a hold of his head and push straight back, or you can slide your hand in and then put your hand right here on the brisket and gently push him backwards. By doing that, it then places the head back in this area and now you can reach down and grab this leg. And when we grab that leg, uh, one thing in regards to the position, uh, sometimes it makes it a little easier on you if you can have a partner that will <clears throat> lift up the back legs so that the you is standing down here with her head and this will help take the weight off of the opening of the vagina and allow this lamb kind of to sink back down inside her. So sometimes that will help give you more room to work with uh, as well as if you have somebody that can lift up uh, that back end of the female for you to work on. So <clears throat> back to the leg, we're gonna take our hand and we're gonna slide it in. And these little feet um, are fairly pointy 
<clears throat> and you need to protect the tip of these toes uh, from the lining of the uterus because as we're trying to move things around in here, these toes can actually puncture through uh, the uterine wall. But if you're careful and take your time, uh, just guard the end of the foot uh, with your hand. So you're gonna come down here and grab a hold of that foot. <clears throat> what you're gonna do uh, to get this front leg into the position, you're gonna, your hand, you're gonna take the foot and you're gonna slide it underneath the, the chest of the lamb. And at the same time, you're gonna take your thumb and place it on the backside of his knee, just like this. Is you're gonna push this knee away from the lamb's body. So that usually is towards the outside of the ewe's abdomen. As you push with your thumb the knee out, that takes this leg or this uh, carpal bone or cannon bone uh, underneath his chest. And now the toes are right underneath his chest or brisket. And then you just pull straight out and that leg pops straight out into the pelvis. And so then once you get um, that leg pushed out, see how much my hand goes under here? And don't worry, he was just taking his usual ba. This doesn't hurt him. <clears throat> and then uh, you'll have both legs there. And then you can pull the lamb's head back up into the canal, put your strings on the feet, and then uh, just pull uh, straight out. Uh, another um, situation is where you may see the tip of the nose presented at the vulva and both of the legs are down here. Uh, again, you need to repel or push uh, the lamb back and then you just repeat that process uh, that I just explained for both of those legs, get the legs up there <clears throat> and then go ahead and extract the lamb or the kid. When we see two legs and there's no head, uh, oftentimes we have this position <clears throat> where the neck or the head is bent back. This is usually what happens. Uh, the head is uh, either uh, listed to the right or to the left. Uh, periodically, you'll reach on this side, you'll reach over here and you won't find the head. So where's the head? Uh, what happens is the head actually goes between its legs and is resting underneath its brisket. So if you can't find the head that's attached to uh, the two legs, then check between the legs to see if you can't find the head. In this situation, again, you want to propel or push back on the chest to push that lamb back into the uterus, grab his head, and again, you're going to take his nose and you're gonna tuck it downward and push his head laterally or backwards uh, towards the abdomen, abdominal wall. That will allow the tip of the nose to go under here. And then you just lift up on his little chin and then pull his head forward. So again, it's push this forehead outward. That causes the tip of his nose to go inward and then you can lift it up and then place it on top of uh, the lamb's legs. Another situation, uh, this is a posterior presentation or essentially the lamb is coming backwards. Um, oftentimes we um, will find these guys with the two back legs actually fully extended, which is great. We can easily deliver the lamb in this position. There's no reason to push him back in there and try to bring the front end out first. Uh, take what God gives you and uh, get these back legs, put your strings on there again. When you're pulling lambs backwards, one thing that you need to be concerned about or to take notice of is the tail. You always wanna tuck the tail in between the back legs. And the reason for that is that these little tails can actually um, bear to the side or straight up. And they are stiff enough uh, and have enough angle that they'll actually cut and tear 
the dorsal portion of the vagina or the uterus. So you always wanna tuck that tail down in between the legs. The other thing that that does is it makes this area here much more rounder rather than having that tail flopping to one side or the other or up uh, on top of itself. So always tuck that tail in. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull. And again, just like we uh, pulled on the shoulders, we could pull one leg first, then the other leg. And then once we can feel that the hips have engaged in that pelvis, give a slight twist or a corkscrew tight motion and then corkscrew uh, his rear end out. Once you get you know, this portion out of the vagina and you can see his hocks, do not take a break because his little umbilicus, which is his lifeline to oxygen, is gonna be right here on that pelvis and it's gonna be kinked. So he no longer has oxygen. So it's important to not delay and make sure that once you start getting these legs out and you can see this much, you need to continue with your efforts to extract him uh, in order to get him uh, out. <clears throat> in this case, this is a true breach. Uh, and oftentimes what we find hanging out of the vagina is just the tail. So we're gonna use essentially the same method that we used uh, to get the front legs up. This time, instead of pushing on the brisket or the chest of the lamb, we're gonna just push on his butt and push him forward. That allows us to get our hand down here, grab that leg again. We're gonna slide our hand under, get a hold of this foot, gently pull this back. And once we get this hock uh, back here, then we're, you see the hock right here. We're gonna take our hand, cup this foot. We're gonna take our thumb, place it back here on this hock, push the hock towards the side of the, the U, and then we're gonna slide our hand underneath his belly and then pull straight back, okay? So it's the same thing. This joint goes outward, the foot joint goes inward, and under and then out, just like that. So um, this is everybody's uh, nightmare uh, where we have one coming forward and we have one coming backwards. And so um, there's a couple of things that uh, you need to figure out. Obviously uh, there's four, there's a, a total of eight legs in there and you need to make sure that you have one pair uh, from one lamb. So the first thing you need to do is to figure out if you have front legs uh, or back legs. If we look at this, um, one thing that may help you uh, see if you've got back legs is that <clears throat> when back legs are presented, usually the bottom of the hooves are facing up, okay? Front legs, the bottom of the hooves are gonna be facing down. The other thing that you can do is you can feel this joint here. And then as you slide your hand along, you'll feel this joint, okay? And this joint, the hock joint feels just like the elbow. But the thing that's different between the back leg and the front leg is that there isn't the knee before you get in this case, there's no knee in here. So you find one joint and then the next joint has this bony prominence on that hock. In the front leg, you've got a joint here and then you've got the knee joint and then you have that bony elbow prominence. So there's two joints before that bony prominence. It's a front leg. If there's one joint before the bony prominence, then it's the back leg. So that's how you can tell if you have front legs or back legs. The next thing to do is to follow this leg to where it matches or attaches to the body and then feel to the right or to the left and grab the other leg that's attached and follow it along all the way out. And then that way, you know, you've got two back legs of the same fetus or you slide here to the front, slide to find the chest, 
and then you should find the neck, follow to the head, go back down the neck, and then find the other leg, follow it out, and now you've got these two front legs together. So identify a pair of front legs or a pair of back legs. <clears throat> In this situation, uh, this guy's coming upside down. You, sometimes you can deliver them upside down, but it's much more difficult. And so ideally you would get uh, the legs on this one, maybe push these legs back down a little bit, fully engage him and pull him out. And then what you're gonna do for this one is you're gonna grab the back legs and you're gonna twist them so that you twist this guy over. So now his backbone is up against her backbone and then tuck the tail because it's coming backwards and then pull them out. Okay, so that's how you would handle <clears throat> this situation. But oftentimes um, when you first go in there, uh, what you need to kind of really figure out is do I have two front legs? Do they belong to the same animal or do I have two back legs and do they belong to the same uh, animal? So once we get them out, how do we get them to breathe? <clears throat> you can slap them, stick something up their nose. I think that's uh, the easiest and the quickest. Uh, and then uh, vigorously uh, rub them, excuse me, with your towel. Stick your finger up into their mouth and remove any kind of mucus. Do not hang them upside down. The reason you don't hang them upside down is because uh, stand on your head and tell me how well you breathe. You don't because all your guts are pushing on your diaphragm, which needs to push back into your abdomen in order to expand your lungs. The fluid that comes out of these guys when you hang them upside down is actually the fluid from their stomach and it's not the fluid from their lungs. There isn't any fluid in their lungs because the lungs haven't opened up yet. So the only amount of fluid that can be in the respiratory tract is in the windpipe or the trachea. And that's not enough fluid to do anything. Uh, hanging them upside down makes it harder for them to um, <clears throat> expand their lungs, makes them harder to breathe. The fluid that's coming out is actually stomach fluid. And if that should, the lamb should decide to try to take a breath as that's coming out, now you got fluid in the lungs. So just keep them on the ground rub them vigorously. As soon as they start to move their head around, sit them up so that they're uh, with their front legs underneath. So they're sitting on their chest uh, and that will allow uh, the best perfusion uh, of air and blood uh, through those lungs to get that little guy uh, going. And then uh, once you get them up uh, and going, uh, you want to check that you to make sure, or doe to make sure she has colostrum. You want to milk uh, those teats out a little bit. Uh, that will do two things. One, uh, there's usually a little gelatinous plug um, that's been there to prevent bacteria from getting up into that udder uh, since the last time she's uh, nursed a lamb. And sometimes it's difficult for uh, lambs and kids to suck that out. So by getting rid of that, that allows and establishes milk flow. The other is you massaging that teat and stimulating that udder causes the release of oxytocin. And we said that the oxytocin was important in muscle contractions for the uterus. So that will help expel that placenta. Also, oxytocin is the hormone that causes uh, the dam to let her milk down. So there's little muscle cells within the mammary gland that will contract and can, can push that milk uh, into the duct system and then into the teat so that that lamb has better <clears throat> or easier access uh, to the flow of that milk. Uh, the other thing is we mentioned uh, you want to <clears throat> dip the, the navels uh, with your iodine uh, or your chlorhexidine and the lambs uh, should be up and uh, nursing within the next 30 to 45 minutes.
We talked about expulsion of the fetal membranes. Uh, we said they were retained if still attached to 12 hours after kidding or lambing. When to worry is if the ewe or the doe goes off feed, develops a fever. You need to get <clears throat> a recommendation from your veterinarian because uh, if you need to use penicillin, uh, you need to use it in an extra label fashion. Uh, and I'm not your veterinarian, so I can't prescribe uh, this to you. But the amount of penicillin that he or she should prescribe to you is three cc's uh, per 100 pounds twice a day for four days. <clears throat> and when you use that amount of penicillin, uh, the withdrawal period is going to be 28 days. Periodically, um, you know, the next day you can give a gentle pull uh, on those uh, membranes. As long as you're pulling, if you're not tearing, uh, you can continue to pull. But as soon as you feel like you're tearing uh, that uh, placenta, then stop, make a knot out of it so that it uh, stays out, uh, hangs down, and that extra weight will uh, help pull placenta out. All right, so we talked about that. Um, <clears throat> so one uh, last thing to uh, talk about is uh, the prolapsed uh, uterus. And what happens here is uh, the ewe uh, or the doe lambs, and uh, because the lambs uh, were big or it was a difficult birth, she feels like there's still something in that uterus. She continues to strain and she pushes the uterus <clears throat> inside out uh, through her vagina and it pops out. A couple of things about um, this. This one still has the placenta. Uh, attached. <clears throat> this one, the uh, placenta has fallen off. Uh, these are kind of, these are emergencies. There's a couple of things that can happen here. Um, she can step on this. Uh, another animal could step on that, cause a tear, laceration, and then she bleeds to death. The two big arteries that feed the uterus uh, are now inside here. And because of the weight of this uterus, uh, these things can actually be hanging all the way down to the ground as they stand. It stretches that artery out uh, and it ruptures. Uh, and then uh, the U essentially bleeds to death. Uh, with these, you need to address these as quickly as possible. Uh, if you're not comfortable uh, putting these in and you need to have um, veterinary help to do this, uh, keep the U uh, quiet and contained uh, until uh, they can get there to uh, work on. As I said, uh, this may occur after a difficult birth. Uh, they persistently strain, or again, uh, they could be laying on a hill and um, the uterus is flaccid enough and there's enough gravity that it just kind of falls out. So <clears throat> in this case, um, you clean off that uterus. Uh, you can clip off uh, the placenta if there's large pieces. Um, I like to take the U and take her back legs and put them over two bales of straw or the side of a, a jug um, so that her head's down and her rump is up in the air. Uh, then lift the uterus up and then work the edges uh, in. Uh, and you just take your time and again, don't use the tips of your fingers because um, there's a possibility that you push your fingers through that uterine wall. So just be patient, take your time, uh, push when she's not pushing. Uh, and then uh, once you get it all in there, uh, get like a gallon of uh, really warm water and pour that warm water uh, into uh, the U. What that warm water will do is it will stretch the horns out so that they re-invert, so that uh, the uterus isn't inverted anymore. And then also that warm water will stimulate contractions and cause her to expel that water and any possible dirt, straw, hay that might have gotten in there uh, during your replacement of that uterus. Uh, usually these don't need uh, a stitch. Uh, once you get it in and those horns inverted, 
uh, she quit straining. Uh, if you have any oxytocin, uh, you can give her um, a half a cc of oxytocin. That will help contract uh, the uterus down. <clears throat> and then you're gonna put her on penicillin uh, for three to five days. I generally give six cc's per 100 pounds uh, for the first injection and then go to three cc's per 100 pounds twice a day after that. Yeah, how many babies can a you have? Is twins rare? I've seen, um, is met in, I've heard as many as six. I've personally uh, seen some uh, Finn, Finn type uh, ewes have five. Some of the dairy breeds, it's not unusual for those to have quads. Uh, do you recommend sharing ewes prior to lambing? I do. <clears throat> a couple of reasons. One is if you get rid of that wool, you get rid of a lot of moisture. Uh, so you're not bringing moisture into that barn. Ewes will uh, be a little chillier if they're shorn. And since they're chilly, uh, it rings a bell in their head and says, well, if I'm chilly, my lambs are probably chilly. So maybe I should, you know, cuddle up with them. Whereas if they're in full fleece, uh, they tend not to do that as much. Uh, I've also seen in wool breeds that uh, their fleeces can be so big that when these ewes lie down, they don't realize that they're lying on their lambs and they'll suffocate, suffocate uh, the lambs. Um, another thing about shearing is it makes them cold, so it makes them move around more, it makes them eat more, and that helps reduce the problem with pregnancy toxemia. When we were talking about uh, C-sections on a doe or a ewe, uh, what are the chances of them breeding again? And will they go uh, Chances of breeding back uh, are, I would say, 80, 90 percent. And you mentioned ring, ring womb and the hereditary, it's, it's a hereditary trait. Yep. Uh, how do you know what vertebrae to dock on a show lamb? And also, how old do they need to be? So uh, the prolapse in the short docking is related to rectal prolapse. The, um, the ideal... Um, place to dock the tail is if you pull that tail down, there are two little strips of skin um, called the caudal tail folds. So they run kind of up by the anus and then they connect uh, onto the tail. <clears throat> the tail dock should occur right at the end of that attachment to the tail. Now, that's going to produce a dock that's going to cover the anus. And so, you know, in regards to show lambs, they uh, tend to dock those really short. And as a result, they wind up getting prolapse rectums. You know, in w West Virginia, at one point, they said that you had to take, there had to be enough dock left that if you took a pencil and placed it underneath the dock, that lamb should be able to hold that pencil between its tail and its butt. Uh, so depending on the state that you're showing in, uh, may or may not allow uh, the extreme uh, short docking. But for commercial uh, animals, the, the tail dock area is right at the edge of that uh, caudal tail fold. And I recommend that lambs be docked uh, from two to five days of age. The younger, the better. With dealing with birthing uh, lambs and kids, how do you tell if they're just sleepy, weak, or underfed? What you can do is if you pick that um, baby up uh, and hold him by his front legs, he should have kind of a little pooch down there along his belly. Uh, and you can actually just gently uh, palpate uh, and you should be able to feel his belly full of milk. The other thing is, is that many of these lambs that are underfed will also have hypothermia. And so if you take their temperature, their temperature should be at least 100 uh, or higher. Uh, if it's lower than that, then they're probably not getting enough uh, nutrients. Dr. Pelzer, do you have any closing remarks? I would like to thank you for participating. Um, it's been great working with you. Thanks for having me.